Good morning. Indeed, it is a good morning. I am so grateful to be here with you all this morning. Truly, we are drawn from north and south and east and west together as Christ's community to worship God and give thanks for God's love, grace, peace, and justice among us. It is good to be here worshiping with you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. For those of you who are new here, I consider myself in good company. Uh, This is my first time to be here at Potomac Presbyterian Church, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a little bit about myself with you as I delve into this interesting parable this morning. A little-known fact about me is that when I went to seminary, I had absolutely no intention of ending up in congregational ministry. I had a passion for mission, for social justice, I wanted to spend my time, my energy, working diligently to those ends. But as you know the drill, the moment that you say some kind of declarative statement about something you would never, ever do, uh, you end up eating those words. I ate them surely, and I I, uh, have fallen in love with doing exactly that thing, congregational ministry. My turnaround experience from not wanting to serve in a congregational setting to really loving the church and, in fact, really wanting most to serve in the church setting was at Lakeview Presbyterian Church in Chicago over 10 years ago. I was a field study student, and here's what happened. You see, growing up, my family had gone to church regularly, much like you all. Maybe not every Sunday, but most Sundays for sure. We did the mission trips, the service projects. I tagged along with my parents as they attended peacemaking conferences, and I really enjoyed all of those activities. Sunday mornings, I remember sitting with my parents for the first part of the service, then heading off to Sunday school. And then once I was in high school, I would sit with my friends in the back of the sanctuary. We'd pass notes, we'd eat candy, we would uh, take more communion than we actually were handed because we'd sneak in the back and go get it. And I suppose, uh, in reality, I never really truly engaged in the worship service. I did have a good relationship with our pastors. I enjoyed spending time with them. But when I thought of my own vocation, I didn't really want to spend too much time during my, so much time during my week preparing for a worship service that I felt had little to do with the rest of the mission and the work of the church. Now, to be clear, I don't blame the pastors of the church for my sense of disconnection. They're good pastors. They cared well for me and the congregation, but from my perspective, I hadn't really engaged in worship. I didn't really understand the value of it. What I really cared about was serving God's people well. And then in my second year of seminary, I learned something new, and this lesson has crept inside of my heart and has opened my mind to a whole new experience. I learned what church really is what worship really is. I learned that worship and mission are intimately intertwined with one another. I learned that worship is needed to feed the spirit, to shore up one's understanding of why we serve others. In worship, we're encouraged to pray, to have faith, to persevere like those who have come before us and As we find that our stories have all been told before in the scriptures, we come here to learn those stories, to be reminded of who we're called to be. In worship, we develop a habit of hope. A habit of hope in God's macro-level justice, God's love for the world, so that when it comes time for me to go out and do God's work in the world, I might have sustenance for the journey. Both are needed to heed the call of the gospel, to love God and to love one another. So this morning, we turn to the gospel of Luke, chapter 18, where Jesus tells a parable of two characters, an unjust judge and a very persistent widow, with the hope of articulating the intimately intertwined existence of prayer and justice. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, startle us with your love. Startle us with your grace. May our ears be open to hear your word for us today. May our hearts be turned towards you with awe. 
Amen. So our gospel lesson comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. I don't know the number of your pew Bible uh, page, but we'll both take time to find that scripture and then let us listen for God's word. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later, he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to God day and night? Will God delay long in helping them? I tell you, God will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So before we get to the meat of this parable, I want to give you a little bit of background to help provide some context to this parable. Though it's not conclusively known when and where the Gospel of Luke was written, scholars place its origin towards the end of the first century. And they agree that Luke's view of truth and history are thoroughly theological, meaning the plot of the Gospel is driven by the divine necessity of Jesus' mission, and that God's will and reign are at work in human history. It's important to remember that the chapter breaks in verse numbers that were added to the text that came a long time after it was written. So when we read this particular text for this morning, we have to be mindful of the fact that the parable that Jesus tells in our passage today was originally heard by a group of folks back in chapter 17. Those folks being engaged in a tense struggle to figure out when, the day, the Son of Man will come. People who are actively looking for the end times and expecting it to transpire in their lifetime. And let's be mindful, when approaching this text, we have to remember that this is a parable. It's not a text on which an entire theology is or should be defined, but it is meant to describe an element of our faith, a part of the Christian experience. So let's get to it. The parable of the unjust judge and the persistent widow. Though just eight verses and vulnerable to oversimplification, this text is one that does have the layers that peel back just like the layers of an onion do. Each time you read it, there's something else to learn, bringing you closer to the core of this parable. The parable begins with a bracket on the front end where Jesus prepares the listener. He indicates the moral of the story. It's one of the few parables that do that. Jesus helps the listener orient themselves towards a lesson on prayer. That's what we're going to focus on today. And then it goes into the brief parable about a woman who refuses to be silenced as she seeks justice from an unjust judge. And the closing bracket then loops back to the notion of prayer again. It speaks directly to the community awaiting the kingdom of God. And as we hear it this morning, what rises to the surface is that the practice of prayer is to be intimately intertwined with the practice of being a persistent voice of God's justice in the world. So let's start with prayer. You see, a tempting interpretation of this parable is that if we pray hard enough and long enough for a pony, that God will grant us a pony. (laughs) Or to hit a little closer to home, if we pray hard enough for an illness not to win its battle. Or for justice as we define it, to roll down like waters, then it will be as we asked. But what we're encouraged to understand by this parable is that prayer takes a longer view. We're not to take the short view, not the more immediate one, 
We're not to take a less precious view of prayer, but instead we are to reframe our approach to prayer and understand it in the context of relationship building. You see, as Christians, we pray daily for all kinds of things, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of lament. We're happy to give God credit for the good things in life, declaring wealth and education, good news on a report, a good grade, or someone smiling at you in the metro. That's a a blessing we describe it as. But when something bad happens, oftentimes our humanity is laid bare as our arrogance asks the question that we think we know the answer to, which is, if God's so powerful, how can God allow for these kinds of things to happen in the world? How can God allow for cancer, for racism, for abuse, for loss, for war? Or we might say, God must not be there because I don't feel heard right now. These are the questions that are real. They're meaningful to us. And we pray about them. But significantly, in this parable, Jesus challenges us to pay attention to our actual relationship with God and the role that prayer plays in developing that relationship. Because prayer is another word for communication. And we've all been in that relationship where communication has broken down and therefore the relationship struggles, whether at work or at home with our families, at school or among family, neighbors or friends. We've all experienced the pain that can come from a lack of communication or a, a miscommunication. And Jesus is drawing our attention to the fact that communication is also important to develop and maintain our relationship with God. Jesus is drawing our attention to the fact that if we get into the habit of praying, in the habit of developing our communication with the one who has named us beloved, like in all relationships where communication is healthy, we will inevitably begin to listen for God's voice in the world. If we get into the habit of praying, we, like the persistent widow, might grow in our understanding of God's desire for justice, for peace, for all of God's people. If we get into the habit of praying, then we might find confidence that God has not abandoned us or the world, even in the trying times that we experience. And if we get into the habit of praying, then we might just begin to live in hope. For the whole of creation, that we might be hopeful enough to work in whatever ways that we can for the justice and peace that is coming. Which brings us to the widow. In the ancient world, widowhood was tantamount to destitution. A woman was reliant upon her father until he found a husband for her. Then the husband was responsible for the woman, and if she did not bear a son to take care of her after her husband passed, well, then she was left alone with nothing. We don't know what claim this woman took to the judge or whom her opponent was. And frankly, it doesn't matter. What is important is that she represents something for us today. She represents those who witness or experience injustice. She represents those with the strength and motivation to stand up against injustice until justice enters in. She represents the anti-racist voice. She represents the homeless voice. She represents the least, the lost, the lonely voice. She represents the voice crying out in the wilderness for equity, for herself, for her family, and her strength, her determination, to persist our evidence of her hope that justice is possible, even for the marginalized. Hers is the voice Jesus chooses to illustrate prayer. And we don't know much about the judge. What we do know is that he does not have reverence for God, nor does he have respect for those who approach his court. It is clear that he doesn't grant justice to this woman because He experienced some kind of change of heart. In fact, the more literal translation of the Greek for verse 5 is that the woman is giving me a black eye, indicating that the woman, the widow, was not only just a pest to him personally, but that he was feeling subject to public embarrassment. He was not converted to justice because his heart was changed. Rather, the widow stood, used her voice as a witness to God's justice, until the judge had no choice 
but to usher in justice. As I mentioned before, this parable has layers like the onion, layers that build upon one another to create this complex narrative. Jesus intentionally used the theme of justice in this parable. That one of the characters was a marginalized widow and the other was a hardened judge. And the juxtaposition of the powerless persistently speaking to the powerful, that's intentional. And while listening to the story of an unlikely voice for justice, we listen for the role that prayer has to play. Jesus encourages us to pray with persistence, modeled by the widow. And the widow teaches us to continue to seek God's justice. Both prayer and voice are needed. And they are intimately intertwined in the Christian experience. The voice will perish or become prone to weariness without the sustenance of hope through prayer. The early church, which first read this parable, undoubtedly prayed for many things that it did not receive. Safety, protection from persecution, relief from the upheaval of the transitions of the time, among other things, I imagine. And God's loving presence and attention remained. And they received the strength and fortitude not only to survive, but to flourish, to be the church. And today, through a persistent and prayerful relationship with God, we are still called, still today, called to be the voice of justice in an unjust world, to bear witness to God's justice and love. Not justice that we want as individuals, but justice that we all need as a community. We as a church, even in the midst of transition, even in the midst of uncertainty, we are still called to persistent, prayerfully, to be in relationship with God and with God's beloved children. The children this morning, they received some twine, and if you're sitting by one of those children, please feel free to take notice of that twine. Look at the nature of the twine, the design of it. Kendra referred to it earlier. The Notice how the twine, it's simply made up of a bunch of littler strings. It's a helpful illustration to us about our Christian faith. The twine, or rather the witness of our Christian faith, is in fact stronger as the layers of faith and practice increase. Imagine one or even a couple of those things, of those strings, they represent your voice, your individual voice for justice. Strong as it may be, It is made stronger. It is made more meaningful with strings of persistent prayer added. As they wrap around one another, they can bear more weight together. They can be more powerful together. And imagine if we were to weave our pieces together, your voice and mine, your prayers and mine week in and week out, as we gather for worship and we gather our collective prayers and voices, the elements of our faith grow intimately intertwined. And I encourage you to ask the question, dear church, what injustice will we point to? What will you pray for? And how will you raise your voice for change persistently? May God's justice roll down like waters, and may the whole world be at peace.